Beloveds, it is our habit to stand for the reading of God's Word, so I'm going to invite you to stand. Um, and there are some folks uh, who came in uh, during the break here who are going to be looking for some seats. And so if there are any empty seats near you, please make space for them. But I want to pray for Pastor Allen um, and, uh, and ask God's blessing on this time together. Let's pray together. Father, we have tasted and seen all weekend long. You're better than we thought. Yeah. You're better than we thought. Forgive us for our lack of faith and grow our faith. Help our unbelief, Lord God. Help us to grow out of it. Help us to have deep roots and to taste sweet fruit even today. And so, Lord, as, as Pastor Allen, Reverend Dr. Allen, <laughs> Lord, as, as he comes in here, Lord, full but also physically tired, it's been a long weekend, I pray for fresh anointing on my brother. Yes, brother. I pray that you'd fill him with your love, that the words that come out of him and the way they come out of him would be evident to all that you are in this place, Abba. You're our Papa. You love Alan. And you're going to share that love with us today. We know it. And so we praise you in advance for what you will do and are doing, even as we ask for more. Make our hearts and our minds ready. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Okay, here we go. Let's read this uh, verses from John together. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, <laughs> said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let me see. Oh, it feels like a good Episcopal church when you stand for the reading of the gospel. <laughs> so, well, a few moments ago, I had a Joseph moment. But you don't even know what that Joseph moment is. As I was, as we were worshiping, I walked around a little bit and was looking at all of you. I had to go downstairs. Remember in Exodus, when Joseph's brothers come before him. You know, they betrayed him, basically assumed he gets killed and he gets sent to, sent to Egypt and he gets put in prison. Then he rises up to be with the king and now he's ruling basically over, over all of Israel and his brothers come back many, many years later begging. He has to go hide. Why? Because he is seeing something that he longed for and now was receiving it. He got to be with his brothers, his family, and heard that his father was alive. When I look at you, when Debbie and I look at you, when Leanne and it looks at you, Joan, you're here all the time, but Leanne and Dad, we look at you guys, you go, this is my family. Amen. I'm actually starting to feel a little bit more like a grandfather to you <laughs> as the years go by. But I was just sharing with someone a few minutes ago that as I look at you worshiping early, I came back from the bathroom after drying my tears and blowing my nose and, and, and was looking at you in a shared, it's like, this is the vision fulfilled that God gave us. You are, you are. 
And God has put in you guys, the leadership of this church now, a vision that he is continuing to fill and multiply and press in as the kingdom of God moves here in Rockland County and in Suffolk. And you're part of today's, what God is doing today. And you, have, you have no idea how much it blesses Debbie and me to be here. And everybody said, oh, it's such a blessing to have you here. No, no, I'm being more blessed. I am being more blessed by being with you. Because it's, we, we just love you. You are family. God called us to sow our lives into this place, raise our kids here. For 23 years, we were the pastors. And then Will comes, I got to tell this, I may have told this before. There was a pastor's prayer meeting. There's a group of us more conservative, you want to call it that, born-again, spirit-filled pastors who met weekly here in Rockland County, different churches around the county. But I remember you coming, I think you're still at Westminster, and said, God is calling me to plant a church in Rockland County. We laid hands on this brother, we prayed for you, but we all went, <laughs> <laughs> like, it ain't gonna happen in Rockland County. Because <laughs> we had been here long enough to know the challenge and the struggle it is here. It is everywhere now. But back in the 90s, I don't know when you came. It was early 90s. I think you came to say that. But what we thought it was humanly impossible, God is doing. God is so good. He is so faithful. And I'm just, it just blesses me so much to see you and, and be with you. So I had my Joseph moment. But somebody's going to need to get me that box of tissues over there. Because when my nose gets too full, it's really hard to talk. Thanks. I think I inherited from George these emotions. I didn't used to be this emotional, but after watching George and hanging out with George all those years, it's the, the emotions just flow. And there's nothing to be embarrassed about as a man that your tears flow because it means your heart's alive. If you can't cry, then maybe you need to have some water poured into that heart and make it come alive like a plant coming up from the ground that desperately needs water. The, I love these verses that we're reading in John. If you could put the, put the, verse, the first, those first verses in John 14, um, uh, beginning with verse 15 back up there, that would be great. I titled my sermon something that we don't really have up on here on the screen, but I, it said, I titled it, There's Something Wrong. There is something wrong. Well, the, we had this weekend because there is something wrong. When you go to see the doctor, unless it's a checkup, you're going because there's something wrong and you're looking for a solution to make your body right. And oftentimes the doctor is able to prescribe a medicine or some sort of therapy or something to bring healing to your body. Well, in life, for every human being on the planet, there's something wrong. And the number one thing that's wrong is that for many, many people, our relationship with our Creator is broken. The number one cause of sickness, the number one cause of, 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 of feeling alone, feeling depressed, being, being hurt, is that we're separated from God. So we talked this weekend about our need for healing. We all need healing, and not just in our physical bodies, but in our souls, because the world mistreats us so badly. It's just so cool to look around and just see people that I know. It's like, oh, now I'm seeing you, now I'm seeing, seeing you, Mark, right now. It's like, People, I mean, I, I love you guys so much for so many years, and to come back and see you in this church now, you have no idea. I'm like John, I was listening at Second John a couple minutes ago. He says, my dear lady, I think, I don't know whether it's to the person leading the church or the church. He says, it gives me great pleasure to see that you're walking with the Lord. That's how I feel. It gives me such great pleasure. Second John 1, 2, something like that. I'm sorry. I do feel like a grandparent visiting the grandchildren. <laughs> and Debbie, you need to be quiet. Happens every time. I know, I, I knocked this microphone off five times today now. So there's something wrong, and I think we probably could all acknowledge that we need healing, spiritual healing, physical healing, restoration and break, from broken relationships. There's a whole gamut of healing. We talked about a lot of that. I'm not going to attempt to recap the weekend. I want you who weren't part of this to talk to some who were. The one who brings us healing loves us so much 
And Pastor Will, I know you've been trying so hard to, to share with this congregation that there's nothing to fear of our Heavenly Father when He wants to bring healing to His children. But it can be a little bit frightening at times when you need to be healed and you have to submit yourself to a process. Some of y'all can see that I wear hearing aids. When I was little, my hearing loss is probably something that I've ever had since as a baby. It just gets worse and worse as I get older. The technology, unfortunately, improves on the hearing aids. But I remember when I was like six or seven years old and I had constant sinus infections. Some, Stephanie's husband is the kind of doctor that does this. But I had to have my ears drums punctured in order to keep them from rupture. Anybody have to have, have, to have that? Back in the day, they would stick this thing on your face called a mask that had ether in it. It was a horrible smelling thing. I'm like six years old, and they put this thing on my face so they'd knock me out so he could stick the needle in my ear. And I was petrified of surrendering to the mask over my face to put me to sleep. But the doctor did what he needed to do. And my ears were relieved of the pressure and the pain went away. Sometimes we are afraid of something that we really don't need to be afraid of. We do not need to be afraid of love. When God comes to us to heal us, he comes with love. But sometimes we have to surrender, we have to give up, we have to submit to that love. And for a lot of us, that's hard. That's really, really hard. Because we've been hurt, People who are supposed to have loved us well, who should have taken care of us, did not, so it's hard to trust the next one that comes along. But our Heavenly Father, and you're going to hear this all the time, He's good. And He's always good. So when He comes to us to heal us, He comes in love. So I want to share a little bit more about this passage from John 14. He's been preparing His disciples for His departure. He's been telling him this is his last few days on earth before he's going to be crucified, before he's going to die and be buried, and then spend how many days, 50 days, whatever it was, after his, after his resurrection, and, and then um, go back up into heaven. But he's preparing them for his death. And they're not getting it. They're not understanding what's going to be happening to him. So they ask some silly questions at times, but in those, and that's in the first verses of John 14. But now he's telling them what they're going to be getting after he leaves. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandment. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I think it's the NIV 2011 version that says, if you love me, then it turns it to a command. Keep my commandments. Anybody here read the biblical Greek? We've got a couple of professors in the room. Yeah, there you go. It's not an imperative. It's a future tense. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Well, let's just change the grammar. Those of you who know me, love, love, I'm a Greek freak. I love the Greek. Let's change that just a little bit. It's a present tense love. If you are loving me, totally legitimate translation. If you are right now, currently, present tense, loving me, you'll keep my commandments. Does that make sense? In other words, if you're in the experience at this moment of loving God and Him in return loving you, you will keep His commandments. In other words, you'll want to. In other words, you won't be able to not keep His commandments because when you're living in His love, you desire to do what God wants us to do. The opposite of that is true. If you're not living in His love, you're going to have a hard time keeping His commandments. I know when I'm not actively living in his love, I can be actively sinning because I'm seeking things for myself that are false love, that are idols, that are illegitimate means of trying to meet my needs. In other words, sin is doing what God tells us is not going to help us, but we believe the lie and we do it and we get ourselves hurt. But when I'm actively living in his love, I have no desire to sin. No desire to sin. Jesus knows we can't do it by ourselves. So he says the next part of this verse. He says, and I will ask Papa, the Father. That the is there in the Greek, but we don't need to necessarily say that because the Greek also says the Jesus in many places in the New Testament. Do you ever say the Jesus? You can call me the pastor. No, call Will the pastor. But you don't call me the Alan. 
Doesn't make sense, does it? So we could say, and I will ask Father, and he will give you another. Well, here's another interesting Greek word, because it actually kind of means someone else like me. That word in the Greek can mean someone like me or, or an additional person. Well, who is this additional person? We're talking about Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. We're talking about the Father, the first person of Trinity. And now we're talking about who? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. In our first lesson, which I kind of skipped over on Friday night, on Friday night, it's talking about this little person. It's not a little person. It's a person who stands beside the first person. The second person stands beside the first person, and she is called Helper. Who is that? In Genesis 2. I think it's either one or two. Helper, Ezer. The woman that God brought to the man is called a helper. He says, I will give you a helper. She will be an Ezer, a helper. She stands beside you. She is your partner. She is the one who you walk through life with. She's the one you share your love with. She's the one you raise your family with. Jesus is telling them, I'm going to give you an Ezer. And we know that is actually the Holy Spirit. I love the way the NIV translates it here. It could also be translated comforter, advocate. Do you need an advocate? A lot of us need an advocate, especially if we're in trouble and we can't speak for ourselves. Lawyers are advocates, right? Lawyers are advocates. An advocate is one who speaks on your behalf when you can't do it yourself, right, Kevin? And a lawyer speaks on your behalf before a judge when you're unable to say the right thing. Sometimes I need an advocate. Most often for the deals and the issues in my life, I need a comforter. A comforter who just loves me and holds me. We did a lot of that this weekend, folks. Loving each other as God was doing healing in our lives. Just, there are a lot of hugs. There are a lot of tears. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> Again, if you miss this weekend, I don't want you to feel bad about missing it, but I want you to share in it. So hang out with some of the people who were part of this weekend, and I really believe it can rub off on everyone sitting here. Sometimes I need a helper. Debbie, in many ways, as though she's, she's my wife and a lover, she's a helper because there's so many things that, Debbie, you do that I can't do well. And we complement each other in the sense of, well, even this weekend in prayer ministry, I was in one of the situations, and I shared this with a group yesterday. I'm almost always with her in, in prayer ministries, particularly if we're dealing with something demonic that needs to come out of a person. I was the point person. You know what that means? In other words, the person taking the lead in this prayer session. And I have only rarely done that. And I'm sitting there going, oh, I wish Debbie was here with me. <laughs> but Father was gracious and he worked, flowed through me. The person I was praying for had probably had no idea how I was praying. Jesus, help me, because I don't know how to do this. <laughs> I'm new to doing this kind of prayer ministry by myself. Well, I would have had a person with me, but in the sense of taking, taking the lead. A helper. Jesus says we need help. Why do we need help? Because we cannot keep his commandments. Because we're all sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. In other words, we inherited that sinful nature by ourselves in our own strength. It is impossible for us to keep his commandments. We must have the Holy Spirit. We can take the the off of that too. We must have Holy Spirit living inside of us, loving us, strengthening us, empowering us. Because our, by our sinful nature selves, we can't do it. So folks, we need healing. We need healing. Jesus recognizes when he says this, you can't do it. His disciples didn't get it that what he's trying to prepare them for, but he's telling us, we are not intended to do it by ourselves. Get that into our heads. Let's get that into our heads. God does not intend me to live my Christian life of doing the right things, obeying the Ten Commandments, keeping the greatest commandment to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the second commandment that's like that, to love my neighbor as myself. And that's what he's saying is commandments. That is the commandment. He does not intend you to do it by yourself. So stop feeling guilty for your failures. But start praying, God, I need healing and I need help. One of the things I love about little children, and it's little children who have taught me how to love my Heavenly Father and be loved by my Heavenly Father. Little children, when they fall down, who do they go to? When they scrape their knees, who do they go to? 
dad maybe, but most likely mom first. And funny enough, I have memories. Of, every time we walk on this campus, I just all these memories from the many beautiful years here flood back. Walking up the back sidewalk, you still call it the manse? What do you call the, okay, the house, okay, the brown and white house. Uh, walking up that sidewalk, I just get these floods of memories of my own children. And I remember one time, um, I think it was our youngest, Rachel, was playing on the swing set. And she was, she was up there and she fell and she got hurt. And she's screaming, and they come running into the house. Ah, where's mom? You know, where's mom? Debbie was away. Rachel looks at me like, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. But clearly, I was second choice. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is our first choice. And some of us need to relate to God with the feminine touch. I was sharing with someone this morning as we were praying for them in the Old Testament, the Ruach, the word. You know, in, in, in a lot of our languages, there, there's a gender assigned to, to nouns. And in the Ruach, in the Old Testament, that word is a feminine word. And that, why I love the word comforter is that translation, because I need a mama time. I need a mother to hold me in my comfort, for my, for my pain, for my failures, for my, for my hurts. So, Helper can be comforter. To be with you when? Forever. Yeah, into the ages. And he is the spirit of truth. Gosh, how much we need truth. We need to be told that we're messing up. We need to be told when we're in confusion. We need to be told when we're not doing the right thing. Why? So that we can be, so God can push shame down on us? No. You know, when, um, Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. When she was deceived, and then he joined her in her disobedience, before then they lived before each other and before God naked and unashamed. Now, I did a lot of weddings in the church, and I said this the other night, I did a lot of weddings in the church, and, and with that I required premarital counseling. Some of you are here in this room probably remember that premarital counseling. And we would get to that part in Genesis about being naked and, and unashamed, and the guys would go, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> and their fiancés would blanch with embarrassment. <laughs> but living without shame is so amazing. It's so good. And we have been praying and breaking off shame all weekend in many of our lives. We need healing because we feel ashamed for the things that we've done or things that people have done to us. And God wants to heal us of that and remove it from our lives. It takes a truth encounter. It takes the Holy Spirit working in us. But there's an enemy that we have that's always tempting us to not listen to our Father in Heaven's voice who says, if you eat of this fruit, you will die. No, to listen to the evil one's voice and to do something to try to meet our needs in ways that God did not create us for. It happens all the time. For some of us, it happens every day. In my own mind, it happens every day. Not necessarily outwardly, but in my own mind in terms of my thoughts. But the Holy Spirit then reminds me, Alan, God did not create you for that. And, and I repent and, and ask God for forgiveness and things are restored. When we sin, when we do something that God says is not good for us, I did not create you for that, we're only hurting ourselves. So this weekend, we did a lot of praying for people who've done things that they truly regret and we broke off shame, removing shame and, and bringing that healing that we long for so much. All right, let's go to verse 18. Can we move forward up to verse 18? We don't have the numbers on there that begins with, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. All right, just back it up just a little tiny bit. Uh, there you go, there it is. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Anybody know what an orphan is? I typically think of an orphan as being one without parents. Yeah, that's traditional translation or traditional understanding of that. But and you go into, the, again, the, the lexicon. An orphan is someone who doesn't have comfort. Mm. So I might suggest that every one of us who are not able 
to experiencing the comforting love of our Heavenly Father through His Holy Spirit, I might suggest that we have an orphaned heart. That you have an orphaned heart. It happened in Genesis 3. When they chose to listen to the devil's voice and, and not their father's voice, they were, the shame came over them and then they were driven out of the garden and they became orphaned physically from our heavenly father by being taken out of the garden and sent away. And that was a merciful thing because if they'd lived forever in the state of sin, then you would have had to have many floods. I mean, this, this, God destroyed the world with Noah's flood because evil got so bad. Imagine the worst of the worst people who've ever lived never dying. It would be horrible. So we were, they were separated from God and got an orphan heart. Jesus came to change that. Not only is he preparing them for his departure, he's no longer going to be physically with them. He's saying, I will not leave you orphans. I will send you. If you move that slide forward one more. I will come to you. Why does he do that? With his Holy Spirit. How many of us can say, Jesus lives in my heart? Raise your hand if you can say, Jesus lives in my heart. I'm hoping almost every hand will go up. If you can't say that, I want to give you an invitation today to let Jesus live in your heart. But he does that through his Holy Spirit. So if some of you didn't come this weekend because you were afraid of what might happen, the reality is you were afraid of Jesus living in your heart. You're afraid that he might just uh, take a little more control. But you know what? That kind of surrender is awesome. It's awesome. It's wonderful. It can be fearful like that, that mask was on my face when the doctor put the needles in my ears to relieve the pressure. It can be fearful, but it's awesome when you surrender to love. It's a beautiful, beautiful experience. I will not leave you as orphans. When Debbie and I and Chris were in Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan's a really cool little teeny tiny country on the western border of China. It's north of Afghanistan. Tajikistan's right below it. Then there's the big Kazakhstan. A lot of us know where Kazakhstan. In fact, when I say Kyrgyzstan, people return the word by saying Kazakhstan. I go, no, 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 Kyrgyzstan. And then there's Russia, north of that. Little tiny cu country called Kyrgyzstan. We're in the far eastern border up on the western China border. And we were ministering in a town called Karakol. And this church had a beautiful ministry to kids who were orphans. Now, they weren't orphaned because their parents were dead. Many of them were orphaned because their parents could not afford them. They didn't have enough money to take care of their children. So they sent them up to the orphanage that was tied to this church, that this church financially supported them. A number of the church members ran, the, ran that orphanage. And a couple of times we got to have experiences in time with the kids. And a number of them were teenagers. And one of the things that struck me the most about these orphaned teenagers is that I would try to make eye contact. We'd be sitting around having a Bible study and even praying with them. And they would not do what you're doing to me, Will, or Christian, you're doing to me. They could not hold their gaze with me. Their eyes were constantly darting back and forth. What was going on? Shame. Shame. When God cried out, called out to the man and the woman, where are you? And they were covering themselves with fig leaves. They were in such shame, they could not look at the one whom they perfectly beheld before. They were like this, hiding. How many of us spend much of our lives hiding in shame from our own loved ones, Again, I learn a lot from my kids, raising my kids and, and seeing children today. And I'm learning more from Esme, our, our granddaughter, who's approaching three years old. We play this game when I put them to bed. Who could stare at each other the longest? I'm sorry, I know you don't know me, so you're, you're a little nervous. Let me do this to Allie. Allie can do it. <laughs> Allie knows me. So you're okay holding my gaze. And we would... As Rachel or Mike or Hannah were laying in bed, I would, we'd just look at each other's eyes. Who's, who could, how long can you, who's going to hold it the longest without breaking away or starting to laugh? Almost always one of us would start to laugh. How come we could do that? Because they love me as a father. There are no walls of separation 
Now, of course, if the kid was angry at me, if one of the kids needed a spanking, I'm just not going to hold their gaze like that. I don't need that's going to punish them or something. But uh, that barely happened. Very, very rarely happened. But holding that gaze was such a thing of love. It was a connection of the heart. God wants to connect to our hearts. So when Jesus says, I'm not leaving you, leave you as orphans, yes, he's preparing them for his physical departure, but he's actually telling them something even better is coming. Let's look at what that's going to be. I will come to you. Yet a little while the world will see me no more. In other words, I'm, I'm gone, guys. I'm out of here. But you will see me. Ha, what's he mean there? Not quite sure. He may be talking about the post-resurrection appearances, but I think he's talking about they could be seeing him with the eyes of his, their hearts after he goes back into heaven and he sends his spirit. Then he says, because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father. You are in me, and I am in you. So where are we in relation to the Father? We are in the Father. Through the Holy Spirit, every one of us is in the bosom of the Father. John 1 tells us that Jesus came from the bosom of the Father, that place of comfort, that place of closeness. closeness. Unfortunately, the NIV doesn't use that word bosom. It says, in close relationship with it's at the breast, folks. Feminine imagery of a heavenly father who wants to comfort his children like my kids wanted Debbie, the feminine one. Jesus returned to the bosom of the father. God is calling us to come to that place and be held by him because he loves us so much. But so many of us have been so wounded by our human relationships, we can't even fathom this is a possibility. Years ago, I was at a conference up in um, Canada, and the pastor challenged this little group I was in, a small group I was in, to ask yourself this question, or ask God this question, but I was asking myself this question. God, what do you think of me? God, what do you think of me? And at that time, my heart was so broken, not over anything suffering Presbyterian living waters did to me, not anything that was going wrong in my family, but just my heart at that time, and I didn't know it, was so orphaned, I did not even have a framework, a framework to fathom that God could speak to me, what he thinks of me. See, I grew up in a home of continuous, ongoing criticism where you never can measure up. You can never do the right thing. And my memory of growing up primarily is that I was always getting it wrong, always getting in trouble. I spent a lot of time on the principal's bench as an as a, as a elementary school student. My mother used to tell me that I get sent to the principal, that my first grade teacher sent me to the principal because I was really funny and I was cracking jokes all the time in class and the teacher would start to laugh knowing that she shouldn't laugh because it was disruptive so she would send me to the principal just to get me out of the room. I didn't know I was funny because when I was a teenager, I closed my heart to my parents, shut my heart off to being one and pretending I didn't need their love. I orphaned myself to that constant ongoing criticism. And when I did that, I inadvertently orphaned my heart to God. So God began to give me revelation. That's lots of stories I could tell on that. But Jesus says, I have gone to my Father. I'm sending my Holy Spirit. And I'm, you're going to now be living inside of my Father in that place of comfort that place, that bosom of the Father, I'm bringing you in to be with me. Then verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he that loves me. It is this one loves me. And the one who loves me, he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Verses like this, when I used to read them, he whoever has my commandments, he it is who loves, this is the one who loves me. I used to feel so guilty about that. Because I knew if even I had a lustful thought, I'm thinking, oh, that means I don't love God. And the Holy Spirit must not live inside of me. Maybe I'm not even really a Christian. Guys, that's the devil speaking to you when we have that kind of self-talk. 
That is a condemnation, a cycle, a cycle of condemnation where Satan is saying, you're not worthy, you'll never measure up, voices, parental voices, and you're not good enough, and you really aren't a believer. Some of us may be feeling that way right now. It's so untrue in Christ. Instead, I flip this thing over. If I'm not keeping his commandments, that means I'm not in a position of receiving his love and returning his love. Somehow I've shut it off. I've made a bad choice in my thoughts or in my actions. And the simplest thing we need to do is, is repent. Say, God, I'm sorry that I had that lustful thought. God, I'm sorry that I'm angry. God, I'm sorry that that guy just cut me off in traffic. I was just about ready to... What do you call that one, that, that salute? I forget the name of that salute. <laughs> you don't do that where we live. In Virginia, you can carry a gun in the car. If you use that finger, you just may be looking at a pistol. I'm serious. It's, if you're driving down 64 near my town, do not pop a bird at anybody. <laughs> you feel like it. But I ask myself when I'm, this stuff is in me, God, what's going on? Why am I in my orphan heart right now? Okay. Love me, Father. Forgive me, Father. Fill me with your spirit. Let's move on to a couple of these verses. He who loves me will he love my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not as scary, said to him, Lord, how is it that you'll manifest yourself to us and not to the world? That Jesus answers him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. That's what God wants. That's God's will for your life. People often come to pastors and spiritual leaders and say, I want to know God's will for my life. Guys, it's right here. God's will for your life is to make his home in you. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty amazing. Really? You want to live in me? That's the main reason you sent Jesus, your son, to die for my sin? Because you want to live in me? He makes it really clear. I don't want to live in that temple anymore. He had it destroyed in 70 AD. Why? Because he wants to live in us. God's presence is not about a building anymore. And I heard some stories about this church being willing to say to God, we give up this building back in, what, 2014, somewhere in there? Yeah, before then, okay. Praying, God, we give you this building because this building is yours. Letting go of it and letting God bring something totally new called all souls. Dying to our expectation that is worldly often is an invitation to what God wants to do. When we die to our own selves and live to Jesus, he comes and lives inside. It's the most beautiful thing. You could be like the Apostle Paul, hanging chained to a wall, and be saying, God is the best God, the best awesome God in the world, worshiping him. Or you could be living in a castle somewhere, in a palace somewhere, and the most blessed human being like Solomon in the world. And it's the same God. His goodness never, ever changes. He wants to live in us. Just a few more things. How much time do I have? As much as you want. Okay. <laughs> I um, temporarily pastored a little church called Jamestown Presbyterian PCUSA Church in Williamsburg. And um, they were pretty strict about that 20 minutes. Y'all came up for our anniversary last year. Really strict about that 20 minutes. And as Debbie and I have been teaching and preaching so much overseas, they, this, they, just, they let you go for an hour. I'm not going to make that do that do that to you. But I, and I told him that. And the look of horror that came over the leadership's faces when I said that. It was amazing. It was really hard to preach in only 20 minutes. Gosh, I had to prepare. <laughs> I won't come any further. Verse 25. These things I've spoken to you while, excuse me, yeah, verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, the counselor, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance of all that I've said. He does not leave us as orphans. 
the Holy Spirit has come to you. If you're not able to receive that, I'd like to suggest that you need healing. That you've been taught perhaps wrongly that the Holy Spirit is someone to be afraid of and to avoid. Some of us may have had experiences like Debbie and I did and I heard other people say, where in perhaps some quote-unquote Pentecostal settings, particularly back in the early days of what we used to call the charismatic movement, when God was bringing literally a revival in our country. And a lot of you were too young to remember this. But my generation of hippies started getting saved like mad. And the Holy Spirit came down. And I remember at one point, half of my high school was attending Young Life Club. Literally half of it was. Private school, okay, 100 people in each class, 400. But there are 200 coming to Young Life Club back in like 1973, 72. The Holy Spirit was massively at work drawing millions to Christ. And the Holy Spirit was being poured out, and there was some really bad teaching. I had someone come up to me when I was in college at UVA, and I was, they were debating with me about speaking in tongues. I didn't have the gift of tongues at the time. Got that gift about five years ago after almost 50 years of asking for it. Came up to me and said, Do you, you know, and he was speaking in tongues while he was, I was standing in, the, standing in the middle of the street at UVA. I don't know which street it was, but I mean, there's traffic all around us. And he was like speaking in tongues at the, t- at the same time and, and talking to me, which was just a really annoying guy. And he's like, he's like, where do you go to church? <laughs> I ain't going there. But he started to tell me that if I didn't have the gift of tongues, then I didn't have the Holy Spirit. And I knew the scriptures well enough to, that if a person doesn't have the Holy Spirit, then you don't have Jesus, because Jesus lives inside of you through the Holy Spirit. But I felt guilty for not having the gift of tongues. And I kind of made a subconscious decision, I don't want that stuff. I don't want that religion he's talking about. I don't want that Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost, I think is what he said. It's more appropriate name. A ghost is something to be scared of. Some of us have some bad experiences and bad tastes. I want to share with you today that no, the Holy Spirit is God's way of loving you, of living in you, of him saying, you're mine, you're wanted, you're my child, you're my beloved. I know you've been preaching this well, but sometimes hearing this from another person is what we need. Let's not be afraid. Let me pray for us. Oh God, Thank you, thank you, thank you that you've given us something even better than Jesus, your physical presence with us. Living in me. We sang a song this weekend, I'm desperate for you. God, so many of us are desperate for you. I just hear the words of the song. I remember singing that song in this church way back, weeping in tears. Father, I'm so desperate for you. Is it possible? Is it possible that you really loved me? I knew in my head, I knew by faith, I knew by trust in your word that the scripture is true. But my heart was telling me, Father, that I am unlovable. My heart was orphaned. God, would you dispel that lie right now from our hearts that we're unlovable? Would you dispel the lie from our hearts and our minds that we really don't need healing, everything's okay, I'm cool, I'm fine, um, and we go through our lives continuing with silent suffering, pretending all is good when it's not. God, we do. There is something wrong. And it's Genesis chapter 3. We're all separated from you. But God, you've given us the answer right now. And we want to grow in that answer. We want to grow in that experience. We want to grow in the reality of your kingdom here on earth. Holy Spirit, come and fill our hearts with our heavenly Father's love. It's a journey. Folks, it's a journey. It's not a one-off. It's a journey. Been on this journey for about, what, 10 years now, Debbie? 10 years, more. 
when God opened my heart in supernatural ways. Father, would you open our hearts in supernatural ways? This weekend I pray one night, God, speak my love language. Speak to me in my love language to receive the reality of who you are. Daddy. Daddy.